Um, we have a short part left. Uh, I would just like to make sure that on distance that you can hear me that you don't have any strange things with the sound. So please just acknowledge in the chat. Um, so this will only be an hour or so. Uh, talking about mainly, I will start off by talking about accessibility since we haven't touched upon that in the course. Uh, accessibility is how do we do our web applications and web pages accessible for everybody, not just those with perfect vision, hearing, uh, mobility. Uh, optimization, however, is more like how to optimize your code so that it will run smooth so that you don't uh, block the queue. We've talked about that, uh, how you could improve performance, basically. Uh, this one I will not talk about today. I have a lot of resources that you will uh, have to look at. Uh, I will show them in the end. Uh, so we will start off by looking at uh, accessibility, as I said. Uh, so this is, I haven't fixed this one, but it's quite ironic that I have a slide that is hard to read when I talk accessibility, because that is exactly what we're not supposed to do. Um, when you think about accessibility, uh, the first thing you might think about is things like this, buildings being regulated in not having thresholds, thresholds uh, having ramps instead of stairs, making it so that the person with wheelchair can enter and exit and that you have special toilets and so on and so forth and in uh, this is heavily regulated when you build a new house you need to comply to a lot of rules concerning accessibility the same thing actually applies when uh, building web applications and web uh, pages so if you are just building something for your own and publish on your own server you will probably not be, uh, at least not in Sweden, you will not be uh, sued for not following accessibility guidelines. However, if you are working for the public, like governments and uh, different parts of the government, like the university or, or other parts of, of the public good, then you need to comply to certain rules. And if you are going to start like a web bureau or uh, a company that makes web applications, if you were to get a contract from, from a government uh, and you'll uh, leave your, what's offert in English? I don't, you know, the proposal that you leave to, to the government that, okay, I can do this for this much money, basically. If you, when you are supposed to hand that in, in many of uh, those uh, uh, cases, you will have to comply to certain rules to be able to, to be in the process. Um, and uh, we will have a look at some of those rules today. So why is it important? Yeah, first of all, some were 10 to 20% of people have functional impairments. And I don't think that what I have is, 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 is counted as a functional impairment. In that case, just having a bad vision. Uh, it's when you have like certain degrees of, of bad vision that you cannot operate. Um, but I mean, there are quite a lot of functional impairments that we can have without them being a handicap in a situation. For instance, if I'm having a broken leg, I'm physically impaired. However, surfing the web will probably not be affected. It will not be a handicap in the situation if I have a broken leg. Um, but there are many cases that will, will uh, be, uh, that w many impairments that will be a handicap when visiting our applications as we will have a look at them. Um, so hearing, visual, cognitive, and mobility impairments are those we will look at today. So starting off with, <coughs> with hearing impairments. For when I say hearing impairment, what is the first thing that comes to mind? What, how can a problem with hearing be a problem 
on a web application. Any suggestions? Video and audio, uh, that is the first thing that comes in mind. I mean, uh, if, if you have a video with audio attached and one cannot listen to it, it will be a problem, especially if you have some governmental information that you want to spread a message of some sort and a, a part of the public will not be able to, 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 to fix that. Of course, then we need to like add subtitles uh, or do some kind of uh, um, I forgot a word, both in Swedish and in English. I think they're quite similar. When you write everything in a big document, it's called... Transcript. Yeah, transcript, thank you. Um, so you need to do some kind of transcript maybe of, of the, for the lecture, for instance. So, so I'm, I'm working in the public right now, I'm streaming lectures, so I should actually maybe have some kind of subtitles for this. However, in, in this class, we have no one with hearing uh, impairments, so it's not a problem. But if we were to have that, then we, and we have, we have I've had um, uh, people standing doing sign language uh, besides me, uh, for instance. So um, you could, could, could need to do that in some cases. What you don't think about often is that what is the first language of someone that is uh, born deaf? Uh, yeah, sign language. It's, it's not Swedish or English or whatever language uh, uh, you have as a, your first language. It's actually a sign language. So providing information in, I, I will take Swedish for example. So, so just providing information in Swedish might not be enough because you have sign language as the first language, so actually understanding government Swedish could be quite hard uh, for someone who's not been born into the language. You will probably, uh, 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 as students from a for foreign country, I mean, you, you know some Swedish, but it would be quite hard to read a complicated governmental text or, or, or the, the terms from CSN or whatever. Uh, you might not have CSM, I don't know, but yeah, you, you know what I mean. Um, so that is actually why you, you might see on some, some web pages, uh, some governmental web pages, that they will be interpreted using sign language as well. So they have the text on one side and then a video with si sign language reading that text in sign. Um, I, I, I read some forum threads regarding this and many made a joke about that. Oh, if you're deaf, of course you can read. Yeah, but uh, the public has, has some obligations that they need to fulfill and that, that could be actually adding sign language as well. Um, yeah, that is hearing impairments. Um, Moving on to visual impairments, this is probably the one that you will think about the most when you, you think about impairments and the web uh, and web applications. So visual impairment being everything from color blindness, I mean a, a big portion of male, uh, ma the male population is, uh, have some kind of problem with colors and color blindness, uh, especially hard, the one being especially hard is the one with red and green uh, impairment where it could be hard to distinguish between a red and a green color or at least knowing if a color is green or red. So, so just, just uh, using red and green to, to signal things on a page could be actually be quite uh, or not be a good thing. Um, of course, we have blind users as well. Um, uh, totally blind users. How, how do they navigate on a page, for instance? Anyone know? Yeah, with sound. So, so you will have a, a screen reader that will read the web page for you, or you have a blind this board with <coughs> with uh, dots that you could read the page as well. Depends. Um, but a visually impaired or a blind person looking at the web page, it's actually more or less the same thing as Google looking at the same web page. They see more or less the same thing. And this is one of the biggest reasons to why, or one of the most more important reasons to why I was so 
keen on you structuring good looking HTML in the beginning of the course. So because if you write beautiful HTML, you will write beautiful web pages for blind people as well. And you will write beautiful pages for Google as well. Because you often say that Google is the, is the, is the biggest blind user of the web. Um, so you will not see the CSS. You are not interested in the CSS. That's just for, for visual context. But for a, visual, uh, for, a, for, for a blind person looking at the page, it's important that the screen reader knows what is a headline, what is a paragraph, that everything is in order. If you were to use the tables for styling, that was common back 20 years ago. So you used tables to, to style your page. That would be a hassle for the screen reader to know in which order things will come. However, when you do it by CSS, you order your columns. That doesn't matter in the, in the HTML, because in the HTML, everything is in order still. Um, using frames, that is also a hassle for screen readers to, to navigate through. So we shouldn't use those things. Actually, when looking at the web standards and the standards that we have proposed uh, that you use and that we have, have taught you, they always take in consideration to make it easy for impaired people. So, so if you comply to the standard, you have done 90, 95% of the job more or less. Yeah. So the question is, uh, does the, the, the screen reader read a rendered page or the, the raw HTML that comes from the server? So if you add a template, for instance, dynamically, will the screen reader uh, observe that? I think they will now, yeah. Uh, but that is problems that has been in the past, that a screen reader would read the, the HTML, and if you have JavaScript, it will be a hassle because it will not know what's being updated or not. Uh, we will have a look at, there is a standard called uh, ARIA that is for uh, uh, web building web applications. And they, that standard will address things like that. Um, but using JavaScript to, to import templates, for instance, yes, it used to be a problem. It should not be anymore uh, because the big, or at least the, 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 the screen, users, screen readers being used should be able to handle that today. Uh, cognitive impairments, that has to do with the brain uh, in, 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 in different ways. So this could be, for instance, users that are, have a hard time to be localized themselves in time and space, more or less. That it's hard to, I mean, if you browse the web, for instance, you, you, you will kind of build a mental image of the pages you visited and how the page you are at look and how you expect the future to be when you click a link. You, you, you kind of have some kind of idea where you are, you, where you're at and where you were and where you will come when you click different links. This could, however, be a problem for some people that it, it's hard to remember or, 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 or build this kind of virtual image of, of the website. Uh, and we need to help with that. And that's why on the first assignment, we might have told some, some of you that you should not have a menu that is like, OK, now we have a flat menu, then that menu will be a, a, a vertical one and it will be at the bottom and it will, will like jump around. You should have a unified uh, UI for the whole site so that you know that the menu is always at top. You should always mark which option, menu option is active so that the user know, okay, I click this one, I read that, then I click the next one, read that, click the next one so that you see where you are all the time. Breadcrumbs, for instance, you know those that you have under the menu often that tells you where on the site you are is often used when listing products, for instance, and categories and stuff. They are also good for this kind of user that has a hard time uh, navigating uh, in that way. Um, mobility impairments. Uh, 
I mean, the, the spectrum is broad. We have everybody from, from being more or less uh, impaired from, from the neck and down to those with some kind of uh, shaking or something like that, that you have a hard time focusing the, the mouse pointer. Um, and in this case, even, I mean, if, you, if you're impaired from the neck down, you will probably navigate the page using uh, either your eyes with some kind of eye recognition that will uh, use the pointer where you look and then you blink and, and, and that will be the same as doing a click. Or you could have something like a, a tube that you blow uh, arrow into that will move things on the screen. So there are many solutions. However, when using those kinds of solutions, they will not be as exact as if you are using the mouse. And one important thing then is to, to really think about having areas that are big when you click. So if we go to lnu.se, for instance, so we have this menu here. Will it be shown? Yeah. So in some cases, you will find applications where you can only click the text in a menu option like this. If you try to click out here, it will not work. And that's a bad thing because then you will need to be so precise in your navigation with, with, with this pointer. So if I'm doing things like that, it will be really hard to, to, to focus on, 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 on the text. However, if you make the whole element, in this case, the list element, or you make the A element spread so that it fills out the list element then you will get a bigger area to point at. Anyone else? Any, is this something you will benefit from in some cases? Yeah, probably on mobile, right? So, so if you're on mobile, you also would, would like those bigger click areas. So, so that's a thing to think about uh, there as well. Um, What more? Yeah, so, so when you're uh, mo impaired uh, with a mobility issue, then keyboard navigation is often used as well. You might not be able to use the mouse, but you can use the keyboard. Some, some persons like me, I, I, I also prefer to use the keyboard even though I can use the mouse, but I mean, you have your hands on the keyboards anyway, so if I can tab between things, I would rather do that than use the mouse to point at things. Uh, and that, that's why it's also important to, to think about using the keyboard for navigation on web pages and web applications. Um, first of all, one rule that you always should apply to and that we will be quite I've written, written it in, in the requirements, I think, for, for the third assignment. It's that interactive elements, you should always use interactive elements when you, your intention is to do something interactively. So, for instance, if you are building this application and you have a close button up in the right corner, so just an image with a cross. It should not just be an image with a click handler on the image. It should actually be an image inside of an A element and a click handler attached to the A element. Because if it's an A element, you will be able to use your uh, keyboard to navigate to the element. And when you press enter, that will be the same thing as doing a click with a mouse. So if you're just complying to that rule, you will actually notice that things start to work quite good without you doing anything more. You don't need to implement a lot of key listeners and things to listen to when the person does this or that. You just need to use interactive elements where you need interactivity. So if I go to lnu.se again and I start tabbing, you will see that the browser will kind of navigate me through all options in order. And this is the order that they appear on the HTML page. Uh, you can change that order if you like uh, using attributes on the HTML tags. 
uh, and I could use tab and shift tab to navigate. And if I press enter, that is the same thing as if I've clicked that one. And then I could navigate in this one, click that one, and I could like do everything using the keyboard. However, with this as list elements and click event handlers added to the list elements, that wouldn't work. Now it's a, ta a elements inside of list elements and those A elements are listening on the click. So it will work. Uh, of course, you can do, yeah. Yeah, button, buttons are in interactive elements and um, buttons, A tags. Radio buttons uh, are interactive in a way. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, they they will work and, and drop downs and uh, all the form elements. They will work with the keyboard without doing anything. However, if if this were to be a, a, a H1, for instance, it will not be a, a interactive. A good, I mean, you, you will notice quite a, right away because you see I get a pointer, a, a hand with a pointer. That, that's a sign that this is interactive. You get that by automatically. If you just import an image, if this was just an image, the Facebook <coughs> icon, if that was just an image, I wouldn't get the pointer. And that, the pointer is quite a good indication to the user that you can click this. Uh, so think about that when you construct the third assignment. In the memory application, I, I, the memory application I have as an example, I've coded that one from the beginning to the end in a demo. So, I mean, you can just look at the demo and do what I do, but it's good if you try it for yourself. But in that one, I, I point that out, how to make the memory game playable using the keyboard. And if you just wrap images inside of Ace, that is done deal. You don't need to think about it. Uh, you can, if you like, you can, uh, yeah, you can change the tab index. And tab index is this thing I talked about that in which order the, the, the elements, you will tab through the elements. Normally they are in, in, in the order of the HTML. You can also, if you like, map keys to certain things on a web page. So I'm, I'm usually, I'm, I'm, I'm using Fiber. I guess some of you uh, also look at this page, for instance. This is just a blog. And you could, if you like, you could just scroll, look through the news, then you can go to next. But a, a more or less standard on the web today is to implement, let's see, I, J, K, and L in the same way as WASD is for, for, for walking in, in, uh, in games, IJKL is for navigating web pages. So if I press K, it didn't work. They might have changed something. But if it started scrolling, whoop, and then it stopped. So they have missed, they have changed something. But if I press L, it will go to the next page. So I could scroll, 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 press L and it will go to the next page. And J, oh, they have J as the next one. Okay. Oh well, that was strange. But, but using the keyboard, I can navigate through this one as well. So, so that could be a neat feature uh, if you uh, do that kind of pages. You can use something like ARIA attributes. ARIA is this kind of standard for, for uh, accessibility on the web and the initiative for, for, for accessibility on the web. And they have something called ARIA attributes. So you can add specific attributes to the HTML to make it more accessible. Uh, for instance, there are ARIA, ARIA attributes that you can add to say that an element that is normally not interactive should be interactive. So you could actually, by adding an attribute to an H1, for instance, tell the browser that this H1 is, inter is now interactive. So if you were to add a click handler to an H1, instead of wrapping in, in, inside of an A element, 
you could use the area attribute for, for telling that the H1 is uh, interactive. So do one or the other thing. You could try them both if you like. Uh, yeah, this is more or less what I mean that you should ne never do. In this case, we get an H1 and when we, this is product page and we, when we click the, the, the header, the product should appear and then it should disappear when we click it again. So we just add a click handler to the H1 and when the user clicks it, we rerun the code. If you do this, you need to add the area attribute or wrap this H1 into an A element, whatever you like. Oh, this is hard to read. Um, you are also supposed to always, when you add visual content, you're always supposed to add a text equivalent to that content as well. In this case, we have an image of a cat. And I mean, if you, if you write an, a blog about cats and you add this image to the blog, uh, you could all, you could do like an image source image dot uh, image cat dot jpeg alt and empty string. That is okay according to the standard because the alt attribute can be empty. You always need to provide an alt attribute to images, but it could be empty. However, the purpose of the alt attribute is okay. So if one cannot t see this image, what should appear instead? And then you should try to add a text that is as, <coughs> as um, outspoken as possible, that actually describes the picture. I mean, you could be lazy and just write cat. Okay, so the, the screen reader will say picture cat. Okay, I know there is a picture of a cat. That's good at least. However, if it's a blog about cats, you should probably try to describe this cat. Maybe you should even, add, okay, so it's this race of the cat. It has these colors. It's looking into the camera. It's not actually. Uh, it's lying on a brick wall. It's sunny outside. And uh, like try to write a text that makes the user feel the same thing about this image that you feel when you look at it, basically. Of course, this depends of the kind of site you're building. Um, but you should always try to add as good uh, of an old text as possible, at least. If you add video, you can do the same thing. Uh, and you can make a transcript of, of, of the, the content, or you can just make a, a short summary of, of the content of the, the film. Uh, you will not need to guess what to do or because there are standards for this. So the World Wide Web Consortium that are uh, taking care of HTML and CSS and other standards, they have uh, uh, created some guidelines. Uh, the first one being the WCAG, this one, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. The WCAG guidelines is for everybody who are creating web pages, more or less. From the simplest informa information page to more advanced web pages. The WCAG is the way to go. The, the first version of WCAG, the 1.0, it had a lot of problems. It, it, in the guidelines, it said like, if you're using Flash, you should do this and that. If you have a Java applet, you should do this and that. And that wasn't something for the future, turned out. We had new techniques and the old ones were deprecated. So the WCAG 2.0 is more like if you have in, like I said, if you have interactive elements, you should think about this and that. If you have visual content, you should think about this and that. Doesn't go into details. However, it's a really good guideline because you can <coughs> always click a guideline and then you can see an example of how to use this in practice. So I would urge you all to, to, to look through this, the, the WCAG 2.0. And this is when you are making uh, offers for, for, for governments, as I said before, 
they will probably say something like, okay, you need to comply with WCAG 2.0, uh, oh, what's it called? Uh, 2.0 and uh, success criteria 2, or something like that. Uh, uh, success criteria AA, I think it's called. So there are success criteria as well. There is one A, AA, and AAA, where AAA is probably like having sign language together with written text, and it's really, really strict. The AA, I think, is the normal one for, for governments. And they will say that, okay, you need to comply to these rules. So when you deliver the product, you need to, to look at those guidelines and, and, and more or less guarantee that you have provided a product that complies with the guidelines. So if you uh, are to work with the web, WCAG will be something that you will come in contact with. Uh, UAG, I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, User Agent Accessibility Guidelines. These are guidelines for browser manufacturers like Google and, and Firefox, so nothing that you need to focus your attention about. Uh, a tag, the same thing, but for authoring tools, that is uh, like if you are writing like Visual Studio Code, for instance, and Visual Studio Code are supposed to help you with HTML, then Microsoft can go into a tag and look how to, to, to how help them develop Visual Studio Code, basically. So nothing to look at either. Area, however, is for accessible, rich internet applications. And those are guidelines for how to make applications, web applications, accessible. Because, I mean, we could do it quite simple on, on a web page. We could, I, I, I mean, I think that a, a web page should work without JavaScript. If, if, a, if a user shuts down JavaScript on its browser, it should still be able to, to, to use your web page, a simple informatic web page. It should be able to scroll down and look at the content. And if you remove JavaScript from the picture, you will comply with more or less everything. However, creating web applications without using JavaScript, it's not, I mean, you could duplicate everything on the server, but you will have some kind of request response cycle. So you will not be able to do a, a, a drawing tool, for instance. You need JavaScript for those kind of things. And this is where our area comes in in place. So, so ARIA has guidelines for making those kinds of applications and you find them on this link. Uh, I will also urge you to try a screen reader. Uh, I think this one, Chromevox, is the easiest one to get started with. It's a plugin for Chrome that you install and it will start reading the page for you. So install that one and blindfold yourself and try to navigate your pages. If you do that, you will get a quite a clear picture of how it is to, or not clear picture, quite of a dizzy picture actually, about how to, to navigate your page and how it is to be a blind user. Uh, so in the development cycle, add 15 minutes of, of using Chromevox to just navigate and see, is this logical? Do I understand things? What happened with all the images? This one is free, so just start using it. JAWS is the biggest one, it's the biggest screen reader. I think that is the one most blind people use. Uh, so you need to pay for it, but I mean, that's a small price to pay uh, to be able to, to, to navigate in a good way. And JAWS, so, so, so I mean, if you are serious about developing web pages with accessibility in mind, you would probably buy a license of yours and have on, on, on your company so that you can try things out, especially if you're working with the public, as I said. You can use the screen reader built into Mac OS if you like. There is something called NVIDIA, not NVIDIA, NVIDIA, NVDA, NVDA, maybe, um, that you can use as well. But try a screen reader. I tried this one last year. Uh, I couldn't turn it off though, so it got kept reading everything. There, I think there is some kind of shortcut, but I had to uh, disable the, the, uh, the uh, plugin. Uh, we'll leave this one for now and have a look at the web page. So I, I will not say much more about uh, accessibility for now. The thing I, w I'm, I want to stress is that if you 
you have followed if you have followed what what we've done in the course uh, you, you, you've got 90% right from the beginning so, so you don't need to think about it back in the days op accessibility was this thing that you okay so you built something and then you try to add accessibility to it but that approach has changed so so accessibility is built into the process from the start and just by writing good HTML you will get a long way uh, there is a demo from whoa uh, where did I go uh, I think it's this one yeah from Google where uh, Rachel here she will she's doing a really good job of, of, of going through some of the more important rules that I've talked about today and showing how, how to implement them and, and why so this one is actually a mandatory resource as a complement to this lecture uh, I think she does a lot of coding as well uh, shows examples of how why you shouldn't do things in in certain ways uh, so please have a look at this one um, ah, she's demoing Chromevox as well actually so optimization I will not dwell upon that uh, but we, we have some resources to this as well um, starting off with this one a trip to the zoo I think I might have mentioned this one it was a talk on Nordic JS two years ago three 2015 September yeah so this yeah I was on this one uh, in Stockholm uh, it was um, uh, a really good talk uh, about the browser not just I mean the browser is quite advanced or the JavaScript engine is quite advanced in the browser it's not as a it's not interpreted code anymore some of it is actually compiled and she she uh, shows examples of, of classic algorithm algorithms where JavaScript is competing against C++ and JavaScript is, is winning uh, in the browser uh, so I it, I, I think if you look at this one you will get a good feeling about the browser or the JavaScript engine as an uh, environment to, to develop things in and how you could actually optimize your code to make it even faster uh, yeah she, she talks about how, how things actually is handled when, when the code is interpreted so please have a look at this one it's really interesting uh, we will uh, ah, I had a, a link to this one right no Jake yeah okay yeah it's actually this is the guy that uh, uh, said uh, li-fi uh, or used the term li-fi uh, he's talking about uh, progressive web applications actually I think this one should have been on on my on, 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 on the talk this morning because this is for progressive web apps and, and offline uh, web applications so please have a look at this one as well um, there is just some I say something about CSS sprites um, CSS sprites is this if you need to load like 20 small icons on the page instead of doing a request and response for each icon you can load an image with all the icons spread out and then you could use CSS to, to just show like with a window show only the icon you're interested in and then you can move this big picture position the picture to see those icons and those are called CSS sprites uh, yeah uh, I think if you um, I'm not sure when we've moved over to HTTP2 though uh, if what should we uh, Andreas he's always good um, if we let's see this was a couple of years ago I tried this if we look in the browser it could be hard to find though look at the network images 
Hmm. Oh. Could we look at sources maybe? Ah, well, I will not find it now. But if if you did this at least uh, some years ago in, in on YouTube, all those small icons are actually just one big image with the icons laid out uh, 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 between uh, with with like one pixel between each other, and then they could just move move this up and down. Um, so, it, at least in HTTP one, it's it's a lot better to just load one bigger picture than several small ones. And if you look at the uh, the optimization algorithms, if you're using the same colors, still, I mean, adding 10 icons instead of one icon to a file will not make a lot of difference in size. However, having 10 separate icons instead will make the overhead quite big because you'll need to compress and the algorithms will need to like embed information about color in each and every one of the pictures instead of using that once. So, so you will save a lot of uh, bandwidth using CSS sprites. And something that you need to know what it is as well is CDNs or a content delivered in networks. That is, instead of serving things from your server, you can serve them from content deli delivery networks closer to the, the user. So, so if I were to have, if I have a, uh, or if, if you take Netflix, no, what should you take? Uh, if you're making a product or, or, or an application and you know that you have a lot of customers in Asia or in, in uh, North America that are using your product mm -hmm. and the servers are in Sweden, it's, it's quite stupid if, if North America should get all requests from Swedish servers, so get all static images and uh, all JavaScripts and static resources get from our servers in Sweden. It's better if we place those images and scripts on servers that are near the user. And then you can use things like uh, Amazon or, or, or Google Cloud Service or whatever to, to, to have them deliver static content and they can always deliver it closer to the user. So they have service in, in Asia, they have service in, in North America. And, the user will be able to pull information much faster. Um, so if you are using jQuery, for instance, you will probably use jQuery from a content delivery network instead of, of, uh, of delivering it from your own server. OK. Um, I have some off-topic questions as well. I will take them in the end. Any questions so far? So this, this this lecture is kind of, you need to do a lot of uh, looking yourself on resources. And how many here are going to take the, the 5 to 3 course next semester? Side. Yeah, the server side. Yeah. So uh, uh, I could, uh, I mean, that course will follow this course. However, it will use recorded lectures in a greater ex extent than, than I've done in this one. Uh, you could probably, whoops, where is it? A server, server-based web program. So it's online now. Uh, so if you go into and look at those, uh, you will see that, no, Swedish, sorry for that, English. Um, if, if you look at those recordings, you will probably find me and John uh, uh, talking about the subject in, in this way instead of, of, of we actually being here lecturing. And this is recorded in the studio in Kalmar. This was before we had a green screen. Let's see, did we get a green screen? Let's see. Not sure. No, we didn't. But so, so we will like have the lectures in this way instead uh, in that course, just, just to, to get you so that you know that. I will not be a part of, I want to say this right now, I will not be a part of that course. However, I will 
be doing the lecture, so please don't send the questions to me, send them to John instead. Okay? Um, yeah, well. So the off-topic question then, uh, can we expect feedback on assignment one and two? On assignment one, yes, I, I, I know that some of you have made releases and not getting any feedback yet, you will get feedback. Uh, I just need to find a time slot to, to, to be able to handle those. Uh, assignment two, you get the feedback during the examination. More questions? I will stay here as for an hour if, if you have any coding questions. Yeah, assignment two retake is next Friday. So that is, if you like a date, it will be Friday the 20th uh, on assignment two. Assignment th three, the retake of assignment three will probably be two to three weeks after the last week of the course. So we often have a retake two or three weeks into the next course. After that, probably after Christmas, and then it's first, second, or third assignment, whatever you have. Yep. Huh? Yeah, there will be two retakes, uh, uh, and then if you're not finished after Christmas, it will probably be the next year. Yeah.